Friday, and one day before the ponies are rounded up in the autumn drift. Sunday will be Hope's last day in the caravan. Unlike the wild ponies, she will not be returning to the high moor. The day dawns sullen and wet as the riders arrive above Withypool for this traditional gathering in late October. <laughs> Strange that when the weather is at its worst, people are often at their most cheerful. Okay. okay. So if you cover the top end of Dillican. Yeah, right over Bob. Super job. Hope has witnessed this scene many times and wrote about it in her book, Moorland Year. I asked her to read the passage and as she read, I could hear the asthma tight in her voice. The drumming of hooves, shouting and the cracking of whips. The galloping herd of ponies comes over the hill, heading for the goyle and plunging downwards. Little wild horses, black manes flying above bay brown bodies, tails streaming in the wind, they pour into the rocky cleft at top speed in a way no ordinary horse would dare, sure-footed as mountain goats knowing every step of the terrain as a deer would know it. Choosing an easier way down, knowing the ponies will head for the river crossing, for well, this is the day of the autumn drift or pony gathering, and the men of the moor, like the ponies, know the way of things. Now the herd is out of the goyle and pounding through the rushes towards the river. The outriders make haste to keep on the flanks, lest any of the ponies try to break away. The river bank is reached, and the little horses plunge through the ford, churning the water and sending the spray flying high. Are there any more to come, Rex? That's a marvellous vehicle. I'd like one of those. Over and up now, way over the moor, through the heather and bracken, wild things in a wild land. <coughs> Watching, I have seen what prehistoric man would have seen. Wild horses fleeing us from their natural enemies. Then, both wolves and men would have hunted them for meat. Now, however, they are being gathered from the parting out, sorting and the branding of foals. Did you get them all right? Very good. When they reach the holding fields on the far side of the hill, they will be parted according to brand and taken to the respective home farms for a few days. Then most of them, those not required for sale, will be returned to the moor again. They're over the skyline now, out of sight the last of the rear guard riders still struggling after them. The moor seems empty without them. Like the deer, they are part of the land. By their presence, one is drawn to an older world. The drumming of hooves heralds the arrival of the tough little exmoors, colts, mares, yearlings and suckers. They're gathered at the funnel before being driven down to Weatherslade Farm just above the village of Withypool. As you can see now, you see them closer to, that they have the colouring of a true wild animal. The dark bay brown and the, most, the mealy muzzle, that's the natural colouring you see it in wild asses, in Chevalsky's horse, in deer and wild oxen. There's no doubt about it that the ponies have been here as we see them today since prehistoric times. They were probably here before ever man the hunter came. Primitive man would have hunted them for food. True Exmoors, once broken and handled, 
make first-rate riding ponies, sturdy and sure-footed. The best herd on Exmoor today belongs mainly to the Mitchell and Milton families of Withypool. Eighty-eight-year-old Fred Milton is an old friend of Hope's, and his farm at Weatherslade is the traditional end to the autumn drift. Remember 1963? Ah, shall I ever forget it? Been here a long time now, not as long as you, but long enough. <laughs> oh well, on the top road, remember how we used to climb over the snowdrifts? <laughs> Walk out over the gates or so, and hedges or so, they weren't there. That's right, just the tops of the hedges there. I still kept the photographs. Yeah. I have many of them, so I thought it was interesting to keep it. The clatter of hooves in the lane announces the arrival of the main herd. Exmoors have been driven to Weatherslade for as long as people can remember. The visitor to Exmoor sees many ponies, but only a few are true Exmoors, the small horses of ancient history. No trace of white on a pure Exmoor, a mealy nose, broad forehead, small ears and flared nostrils. Small, yet strong enough to carry a man. They are few in number, but proudly protected by their owners, they survive into the modern age. Each owner identifies his own ponies, by sight as much as by brand, until each one is claimed. Later, tails will be trimmed and the foals branded before they are released for the winter. Rex has been in charge of the Milton herd today. Well, what are they trying to do? Well, Bob Mitchell's trying to sort his view out, I think. Uh -huh. There's two mares without suckers in on Halscom. Is there? Yeah, with with um, Bob Mitchell's. Oh. So when they get them in, they said they, they haven't got suckers with them. No. Um, so they'll get them back on there again. Oh, it. that's all right, yeah. So, but, so if she could be, there's a chance that could, she could be one of them. Yeah. She's plainly marked. She's got mm. number 80 on the hip, you know. You see, no one will be able to get in touch with me directly by the phone. Mm. But we can always resort but to there is one, <laughs> there is one thing, that, and that is that uh, I shall have a daily post. Yes, absolutely. Mm which I don't, of course, get at Burnley Ball. Are you living on in Withypool? I'm not. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Got to settle down for the winter, but I don't want to. <laughs> well, I think it's short, it's a sensible thing. Well, the That's the first time that you you did that alone, yes. but on, right with the barrel. Yes. And uh, you didn't know whose it pony it was at the yes. time, as you um, came on back. I know, I only know it was a very fine stallion, a real, a right. real Exmoor. That's right. And you thought that you saw some in the distance. And yes. This one came up to see who this lady yes. was, and he just stood there, and you just sketched mm -hmm. it. And you came back to Willyball, and the next day you showed it to someone down at Willyball, Mr. Uh, Barrow. By uh, yes. oh yes, he said, I know whose pony that is. He said, that's the best pony on Exmoor. He said, that's Forrest. Yeah, old Forrest. He right. wouldn't have any yeah. other horses near his herd. Yeah. I remember once walking along the top of Bradmoor near the uh, long fence there. All of a sudden, two horses came pounding along at full gallop, and as they passed me, I saw they were two big hunter geldings, obviously got out from under the field. But why were they running like that? There was this small Exmoor 
like a terrier behind a bullock, chasing them to the forest. Yeah. He was seeing them all. Yeah, yeah. He ran them all across Brandymore, yeah, yeah. and he didn't give up until they crossed the road by Brandymore Gate. Then he thought they'd gone far enough, and then he went back to wherever he came from, to yeah, his yeah. herd. Yeah. Soon, Bob Mitchell's ponies were parted out. It would be a few days before their unshod hooves gained the freedom of the moor again. The landscape was now empty of ponies, left to the sheep and the deer and the rain, a brooding quiet. We said our goodbyes, Hope wishing to return to her caravan alone, to pack a few belongings. A remarkable era was drawing to a close. Shortly afterwards, she fell ill. I didn't know it then, but we wouldn't meet Hope again for another three years. In 1997, new changes were threatening Exmoor. A National Trust ban on hunting would strike deep into the heart of the local community. And tourism was taming the very wilderness that visitors came to see. Hope, who possibly more than any other, loves this land and its traditions, wanted to finish the film. There were places to go and things which needed to be said. That's Felston Point over there. It's yeah. almost as if we're on the edge of the world, and, isn't it? And Selworthy. Beautiful. And, uh, there's the vale below. On that cold, sunny spring day, we were on our way down from Dunkery Beacon to Weber's Post. The Devon and Somerset staghounds would meet here on National Trust land for the last time the next day. You turn across the next bit there and you come, come out to Weber's Post. This is a favourite picnic spot, isn't it? With yes. locals and holidaymakers alike. Turn in here, shall yes, we? Yes, turn across. And you go right across and come out on the where the sacrificial altars are. Apart from this, I you hate this. Hideous. All the ghastly things to put up. And there's another one along there, in the midst of this wonderful scenery. When did they put this one up then? Because I only remember there never mm. being one here. Well, this I think was the first one, and the one along there the second. And what's the earthly point of it? I mean, if people want to know where they are, well, there are maps and small guidebooks on sale at every local shop. Perhaps this was the National Trust's way of celebrating their centenary. Well, <laughs> so help me, if they wanted to do that, they could have put up a nice little uh, simple stone. This like is all... they have, like uh, exist in many parts of Exmoor, the simple little memorial stones, just bits of natural stone with an inscription on them. But of course, this is all about tourism and access mm -hmm. to the countryside, so what do you think about that? People say they love the wilderness land, but they don't. A true wilderness, whether it's a few square miles or a vast tract, is a violent and dangerous place. And a place where you must take risks to come to terms with both it and yourself. But if you do all this to it, suburbanise it, widen the footpaths, cut the bracken in case it should be poisonous, put up little signs all over the place telling you either what you want to know or what you don't want to know. In the end, making sure nobody can get lost. Well, in the end, what's the point of it? I think it smacks a little bit of the theme park. Yes, 